Okay. So we've seen this question a lot um, over the course of this meeting. Uh, Natalie introduced it um, at the beginning of the meeting as a bit of a kind of running joke among us, uh, those of us who've been coming to all of these meetings over 10 years. And uh, it's a nice question, and it kind of started as a, a really nice sort of positive question about what, what is it we do and how can we include everyone. And, and I do think it's, you know, it's become a bit of a running joke, but it's still a nice question to ask. But the question I'm going to ask uh, today is rather, why is macroecology? And this is, well, I was originally thinking of this as a kind of a, a midlife crisis talk about why are, we, why are we doing this? And then I realized that it's a question that's been plaguing me since, uh, for, for a long time, actually. Um, so I remember going to the first uh, student conference on conservation science as a, a PhD student back in 1999, I think, and uh, Stuart Pym gave the plenary there. And I paraphrase, uh, but his message was, it was quite a macroecology heavy conference actually. And his, his, his kind of message was, why are you wasting your time doing all this macroecology when you should be on the ground doing conservation? Um, and that, that sort of stuck with me. Um, and then um, a few years after that, I had a um, moderately traumatic and inevitably unsuccessful interview for a NERC fellowship. And one of the panel members there, and, and I don't paraphrase, <laughs> said, uh, this macroecologist just all a load of rubbish, isn't it? And, and so it's a question that has kind of, you know, it's been, been playing on my mind for a number of years, and, and I want to sort of unpick it a little bit uh, over the next few minutes. And I'm going to return to 1999. We've already seen this, this paper referred to in Tad's talk. Um, I was kind of expecting groans when this went up. Um, I think we could probably have uh, a fairly heated discussion about more or less every paragraph in this paper, which is the sign of a, a good kind of forum piece, I think. Um, but I want to uh, home in on, on what John said about macroecology. So he called it, you know, we've had various definitions today, but uh, John Lawton said this is, that macroecology is a blend of ecology, biogeography, and evolution, and seeks to get above the mind-boggling details of local community assembly to find a bigger picture whereby a kind of statistical order emerges from the scrum. And this is a quote that's kind of stuck with me. He goes on, macroecology is a search for major statistical patterns in the types, distributions, abundances, and richness of species from local to global scales, and the development and testing of underlying uh, theoretical explanations for these patterns. And I think this idea that we're, what we're trying to do as macroecologists, above all, is trying to see the wood, not, not the trees, and not just the trees anyway, is, is, for me, that's kind of fundamental to what we're trying to do in macroecology. Um, that's not to say the trees aren't important. And, you know, I'm very grateful that there are people out there studying, spending their lives studying individual trees so that I can pull all of that together and see the wood. And, and it's complementary. And I think we've seen in the... The talks this morning as well, how you can scale up small scale data is, is really interesting. Um, but, but what we're trying to do as, as macroecologists is go beyond those individual trees. So where have we got to? So macroecology under, that, under Lawson's uh, definition there was trying to identify statistical patterns. Now, I'm not going to try and well, maybe I am going to try and summarise Brian's talk uh, in, in, in 10 seconds rather than 10 minutes. But uh, um, I think, you know, we've seen an overview this morning of, of exactly what macroecology has managed to achieve in terms of identifying these kinds of patterns. We had uh, a certain amount of this, um, and then uh, we went through a phase where this was uh, kind of all the range. Um, and... <laughs> And out of that, we've kind of pulled some general things, and these are the kinds of uh, shapes of distributions that we often see. And again, not to repeat what Brian's been saying, but um, you know, things like abundances across species tend to fit this kind of uh, this distribution, and we have quite a lot of macroecological relationships, which are more or less strong in this kind of sense as well. Um, so particularly anything that you know, scaling with body size, metabolism, and so on, but also uh, relationships between different kinds of uh, measures of abundance and so on. But then the next thing we, 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 we try to do is to test theoretical explanations. And we've spent a reasonable amount of time arguing about curves fitting these different, these different kinds of distributions or the same distribution. So 
you know, mechanistically very different models, but they uh, actually statistically are very similar when you fit them to curves. Um, we've argued about, you know, exponents on these kinds of relationships. We've argued about whether relationships are statistically inevitable or ecologically inf interesting or some kind of mix of both. Some of these arguments have been productive, I think, and I think when they've been arguments over mechanisms, um, and particularly, you know, when they uh, are mechanisms that make multiple testable predictions, I think they've been productive. Some of the arguments have been less productive, I think, when they're just sort of quibbling over statistical fits. That's my, my personal view. But a lot of this has been fairly well established since probably before the beginning of this SIG. So where have we taken this understanding? And I'm, I'm setting this up as a little bit of a straw man, okay? There's been some fantastic talks over the last couple of days where I can see what has improved and where we've gone since then. So I um, take this with a little bit of a pinch of salt. But this is from my poster last year about, you know, what do we do? What, <laughs> what's our answer when we're asked what should we do as macroecologists? And I, this was sort of triggered by actually being in discussion sessions where we've asked this question, you know, if I give you 10 million pounds tomorrow, what are you going to do with it? And, and, and the kind of academic pressure as well, some of us were discussing yesterday, I think, the pressure on us as, as, as academics to have expensive ideas that not necessarily good ideas, you know. And there's a conflict there in some areas of science. The good ideas are expensive. In macroecology, that's not necessarily the case. Um, so... If all we're doing as macroecologists is just sort of corroborating these major relationships that we've already documented pretty well, and we're doing it better with better and better data, more and more data, better and better statistical methods, that's kind of, that's, that's good, yeah. But is it enough? So I'm going to finish with a few thoughts about why I think macroecology remains a useful way to spend a career. And some of this has already been articulated in the session, so you know, I'm not going to repeat what Manuel has just said about um, macroecology and conservation. I think macroecology does have a role to play in, in conservation, certainly. Um, I think there's more we can do to test theoretical explanations. And I, it, on, this, on this level, I want to kind of bang the drum a little bit for a, an idea that I've been toying around with for a good while now, called, which I sort of tentatively call comparative macroecology. Um, and I've sort of mentioned it in the hope that someone cleverer and more energetic than me might think it's a good idea and, and take it up. Um, but the idea is that the world offers us a wide range of, of natural experiments. You know, coral bleaching is, is a good example of a natural experiment. Uh, it's a horrible example, but a good example, if you, if you like. But there's a lot of these kind of natural experiments which potentially allow us to actually test some mechanisms and tease apart uh, different mechanisms that might drive... Uh, macroecological patterns. My favorite example is, is the deep sea. Um, this is a, a figure adapted from something that I wrote also 10 years ago. It's almost as if I haven't heard any ideas since. Um, but it's showing temperature variation over the course of a year um, in, in, in air temperature over a, over a latitudinal gradient, uh, air temperature at the sea surface, and then in the deep sea. And the deep sea is, is interesting because the physical environment doesn't change that much. You know, it's cold everywhere all the time. Um, the temperature variation is really, um, is, is really low, um, but it's extremely food limited. So you can start to tease apart the different effects of productivity and temperature in a way that's much harder to do on land. You can do it with some, you know, some statistical methods, but in the deep sea you've got you know, huge latitudinal gradient, lots of patchiness and, and, and heterogeneity and food availability, uh, but temperature is pretty much the same everywhere. Um, so people are starting to explore this. Um, there's, there's been some nice work on brittle stars, looking at diversity in brittle stars driven by, by productivity in the deep sea versus temperature in shallow waters. Um, and also the kind of work that my, uh, my, my friend Craig McLean does. So Craig is a, kind of a bit of a pioneer, I think, of deep sea macroecology. He's a, he's a deep sea biologist, but he, um, he went through Jim Brown's group um, about the same time that I was going through Kevin Gaston's group. So our, kind of, our careers have been somewhat parallel in that respect. Um, and yeah, Craig had, brings this kind of macroecological philosophy to deep sea biology and, and has some, some really creative and interesting ideas, I think. 
And the final point that I want to make is that, you know, macroecologists have really useful skills. And, um, you know, we've seen over the last couple of years the importance of being data literate and being able to make sense of huge amounts of data, um, being quantitative and, you know, having the data skills, the visualization skills and the storytelling skills to, to make sense of, of, of complexity in a, in a data rich and confusing world. Um, and, and these skills are applied, you know, in our own work. Um, we, you know, I kind of slightly uh, facetiously on the first day said that macroecology is, is, not, is not primarily data limited anymore, but we are bombarded by lots of data, but the, the kinds of data we're bombarded with are differing as well. So um, Ward Appleton's at, at OBIS uh, told me recently that I think about half of the new marine species occurrence records that they uploaded to OBIS last year came from eDNA. So you know that, that's that's just transformative potentially, but it brings with it its own its own methodological challenges. And there's other things, you know, as remote sensing, there's animal tracking, image recognition, using citizen science data sets, and so on. Where I think macroecologists are really well placed to uh, to help make sense of those. Um, you know, we use statistics, we use data science, we use visualization, and then we've got e ecology in our makeup as well. So it's it, it's. Um, you know, extracting order from statistical scrums is, is kind of our thing. Um, and this goes beyond macroecology as well. You know, I've had people come through my group who've gone on to use their skills in, for the National Health Service or for in major insurers and things like that. So these are, these are useful skills. And, and my feeling is that, you know, releasing macroecologists into the wild is, is, is always a good thing. Um, so to return to the question that I set at the beginning, why is macroecology? I don't think I've particularly answered it, but I just want to encourage you to consider this question. You know, I think it is useful for us to question why we're doing things as well as what we're doing. I was thinking about how to wrap this up and I, um, I, I remembered a blog post that I'd written in 2012, yeah. Um, <laughs> musing on Sir Peter Medaware, uh, he, 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 he gave a speech, wrote an essay about two conceptions of science, which he roughly, which are roughly speaking, although he used different terminology, it's kind of pure and applied science. And Medaware was really resistant to that kind of pigeonholing, and he described himself instead as a meliorist, which is one who believes that the world can be improved by finding out what is wrong with it, and then, then taking steps to put it right. And he advocated research built on starting with a concrete problem. What is it that we're trying to solve here? And then opening up the research, using the, using the methods, whatever methods are necessary. And I think macroecology is really well suited to that kind of approach, to identifying problems and then being a magpie, you know, picking and choosing the data and the methods uh, that are appropriate to, to try and solve that problem. And God knows there's, you know, there's plenty of problems out there at the moment that, that, that could do with some, some of this kind of insight, I think. So, I think the uh, macroecological approach of extracting order from statistical scrums remains a really valuable tool to help solve some of the problems facing the world at the moment. And I hope this will uh, trigger a little bit of discussion later on. Thanks. <laughs>